Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Fox Sociology. Maybe that's what I'll call this um, now. So, hello, today we're going to talk about race. Okay, there's a couple of definitions here that we can get to. Um, there's one definition from Dalton Conley in your textbook. Um, a group of people who share a set of, co of characteristics, typically but not always physical ones, and are said to share a co common bloodline. That's one definition. I like this one from my former textbook from Anderson and Taylor. A group treated as distinct in society based on certain characteristics, some of which are biological, that have been assigned social importance. So um, race is something imposed on people from society, okay? This is not something that we choose, okay? This is something imposed. We are placed into racial categories, okay? See Conley's discussion of race versus ethnicity on pages 339 to 341, but, you know, one of the main distinctions between race and ethnicity is that race is um, has to do with um, that race is imposed from society and um, ethnicity is something that's voluntary. OK, it's cultural. OK, so ethnicity more relates with culture. So there's a difference between black and African-American. OK, there's um, there are black people in the world who are not African-American. OK, one's a race, one's an ethnicity. Sometimes they're used interchangeably, but sociologically, race is, uh, you know, externally imposed, often based on physical characteristics. And ethnicity is a common history, common language, common um, religion, could be or common kin ties, things of that sort. Language, that's another one, too. OK. So race is a social construction. And what I mean by that and what Conley means by that, and what sociologists mean by that is that it is not given in nature. OK, a social construction is something that exists because we say it exists and that shared meaning has been institutionalized into the regular order of society. So it's perpetuated like race. OK, so um, racial categories change from time to time. You see, if we were, um, if race were something natural, then we would have to, um, we would have to like see it in every society throughout time and place. And that's not the case. OK, a guy named Madison Grant a long time ago wrote a book called The Passing of the Great Race. And in there, he talks about a lot of races, but focuses on several European races. The Mediterranean race are consider were considered the intellectual uh, race, uh, came from the shores of the Mediterranean Sea and spread out. The Nordic uh, were the rulers. They were the um, aristocrats, the rulers, the soldiers, the sailors, the adventurers, and all that. They were considered the superior race. Okay, and the Alpine were peasants. Okay, um, they're from Eastern Europe and beyond. Um, and Grant thought that uh, race mixing here was terrible, a social crime, and he was concerned about the passing of the Nordic race. Okay. But today we don't have those racial categories. Um, white people don't look at each other and say, well, you're Alpine or you're Nordic or you're Mediterranean um, and like place them in a racial category. And nor is that institutionalized. I have not seen, for example, on the, um, you know, when you apply for something or like, you know, when you fill out a form or something, there's a box about race or ethnicity that I have not seen Nordic or Alpine on that. It's not a racial category as it is today. OK, so um, also the one drop rule um, shows uh, um, the um, uh, the social construction of race. Uh, Back in the day, in some states, if you had a black ancestor, you were considered black. OK, um, some states had it as one eighth. Some states had it as one sixteenth. Some said if you have it at all. And 
Um, there's this old documentary called Race, the Power of an Illusion um, that I'm going to refer to later. And one of the um, things that uh, he talks, um, that somebody talks about in there is that because of this phenomenon, you can cross state lines and literally change race. And so what that means is that if you give me the power, I can make you any race I want you to be. Um, Plessy versus Ferguson was part of that too. Plessy was one eighth black, I believe, and he wanted to ride in the train in um, in uh, Louisiana, and um, and so this was set up for a test case in uh, the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that uh, separate but equal accommodations could uh, could occur, and that you know Louisiana could um, define race how they wanted there. Okay. Um, the Irish were not always white in the United States. The Irish became white. They were referred to as Negroes turned inside out. Here's a quote from a black slave. My master is a great tyrant. He treats me like a common Irishman. So the Irish became white. Um, much of the story has to do with adopting the attitudes of the, um, of the dominant culture and um, including racial attitudes. Okay, so what else do we have? Um, we have, um, okay, oh, back to the one drop rule. In South Africa, under apartheid, if you were, um, if you had a black father and a white mother, you were considered colored and you had less rights than your father and more rights than your mother. Okay, so it's a new racial category, but under the um, under the one drop rule in the United States, if that were the time, you'd be considered black. Okay, so race is a social construction um, to um, to um, you know to like uh, finish that part off. Okay, now. As um, W.I. Thomas said, in terms of the Thomas theorem, if people believe that situations are real, then they are real in their consequences. And I think that nothing proves this more than race, okay? Maybe some people could argue gender is just about the same, but nothing proves it more than race does, okay? So um, there is still racial inequality by race in the United States, okay? So... We've got, um, for example, in terms of income, um, white income in 2017, um, median household income by race and Hispanic origin was uh, white income 68,000 or so, black income about 40,000 or so, Asian income about 81,000. Don't get confused by that number. Okay, there's a couple things going on here. Um, Asians tend to be populated or tend to be concentrated in two urban areas where wages are higher, but um, so is the cost of living. There are some rural Asian um, areas, but not as many as there are black and Hispanic. Okay. Um, you'll more likely have that in rural areas. Also, black and Hispanics and whites are more likely to live in the South. There are some Asians in the South, but they tend to be um, concentrated in urban areas, you know, on the coasts and things. So, um, also, Asians are more likely to have more members of the household working, and that will increase the household income. Okay. If you also look at the uh, range of income along among Asian groups, it is uh, very wide. There's a very wide range of income for different Asian groups. Okay, so um, let's get to wealth. Okay, um, median value of assets for households by race in 2013. This is from the U.S. Bureau of the Census. Okay, so you have um, 
white wealth at 130,800, black wealth at almost 10,000. Okay, these statistics are redone every five years or so, and so they should be coming out any time now. Asian wealth about 156.5, Hispanic wealth of about 17,530. Okay, so um, there's it's 2019, and we still have racial inequality. Um, why is this? Okay, why do we have this thing? Well, here's one theory. Um, William Julius Wilson wrote a book in 1978 called The Declining Significance of Race, and it made a big splash in sociology, okay? And he says that um, basically um, what explains the persistence of racial inequality is social class inequality. So there used to be racial segregation or racial um, discrimination that occurred, but that doesn't really happen anymore, and now it's just social class reproducing itself. As Wilson says, quote, race relations in America have undergone fundamental changes in recent years, so much so that the life chances of individual blacks have more to do with their economic class position than with their day-to-day -day encounters with whites. Okay, there's a smidgen of truth in this. Okay, um, for example, oh, to finish it off, it's about, so it's about social class and social reproduction. Remember, I talked about social reproduction, the tendency to be of the same social class as your parents. Okay, and I'll talk about that more later in the course, too. Okay, so the smidgen of truth, and it comes from the author of your textbook, Dalton Conley, who wrote a book called Be Being Black, Living in Red. First of all, wealth is for a rainy day, okay? It can take one through difficult times, like layoffs, without experiencing downward mobility. So if a white um, person gets laid off from the job, say from a, um, oh, I don't know, the Tesla plant or something, a car factory or something like that, they get laid off, it, you know, would be stressful, but they could use the wealth that they have to uh, make it until the um, uh, until they can get a new job and not experience downward social mobility. For um, many African Americans, if they experience a layoff, then they're more like they don't have the same kind of wealth to um, to pass. Um, the same kind of wealth to survive that, so they could like you know. Um, lose a home or get evicted from a home if they're renters, which is more likely because they don't have that wealth in their home. Okay. So more likely to experience downward social mobility. Uh, wealth is also um, passed on from one generation to the next. And so is credit. Okay. So um, the finishing point for one generation is the starting point for the next generation. Okay, so uh, let's take a young white couple who is, uh, uh, let's say they got married and let's say they want to raise some children. So they'll want to buy a home. Okay, so um, how, but they have not saved up the 20% down that you need to buy a home. What do you do? What about asking your parents for a down payment? Okay, because their parents could probably access their wealth and, um, and, lend them the down payment and they can co-sign for them because maybe that young couple hasn't built up enough credit okay um for many african-american families so take that african-american counterpart perhaps there's not as much wealth that can be passed down in other words like um because the, um, the parents cannot um can cannot do not have the wealth or the credit necessarily to uh, to help them out the same way. So they have less well. African Americans have less wealth to pass on to the next generation. Okay, so social class matters, and social reproduction does matter. Okay, yet if William Julius Wilson is correct, if it's more about social class and social reproduction and not. Um, uh, racial inequality. If um, if he is correct, then when uh, so an African American experiences social mobility, um, then they should um, 
be at the same level as whites. And here's what I mean. Let's the four indicators of um, of social class: well, uh, income, wealth, education, and occupation. If he's correct, then um, if uh, an African American or Latino earns a graduate degree, they should get the same amount of income as whites. Okay, let's go to some slides and see. Okay, this is median weekly earnings of full-time wage and salary workers age 25 and older by educational attainment 2014. Annual averages, this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics weekly earnings okay let's get to um okay i'll get to gender next week okay so but let's get to um you'll see that big uh advanced degrees for um between whites and african black or african-american okay so uh weekly earnings um th there is about two under advanced degree at the bottom about a 200 $41 difference. Whites making $1,390, Black or African Americans making $1,149. So it's a difference of $241 per week. That adds up over the month, the year. Let's say it's, it's almost $1,000 a month, $12,000 a year. Um, 120,000 over a decade, that adds up to quite a bit of money, okay? Um, similar thing happening between those with um, a bachelor's degree and higher and bachelor's degree only, okay? You see, you can like, you know, pause this recording and look at it and just uh, study the um, discrepancies here. Um, so, yeah. So even like uh, and even like less than high school, whites make more. Okay, whites make more th than Asians, and high school graduates too. Whites make a bunch more. Okay, so um, so you might um, want to study this and uh, you know think about like you know what kind of discrepancies there are. Okay, so um, here we have next is. Um, um, this is uh, median earnings of full-time year-round workers ages 25 to 34 by race, ethnicity, gender, and education level from 2013 to 2015. Okay, so this is from the College Board. These are young workers. Okay, so let's compare the males. Okay, so advanced males with an advanced degree. Uh, White males with an advanced degree, 66,900 uh, per year, okay? Black males, 52,600 per year with an advanced degree, okay? Um, compare those with um, a bachelor's degree. White males, 56,500. Black males, 48,500. That's 8,000 a year. Over 10 years, $80,000. Okay, so you're getting my point. That's quite a bit of money. Okay, so um, with, um, and you can like stop this and study this if you want. Okay, even like a high school, uh, high school diploma, 36,700 for whites. Um, and, um, for black males, 27,800. As a matter of fact, um, white males with a high school diploma make more than black males with an associate's degree. This is, remember, these are young workers, okay? So, William Julius Wilson's thesis has basically fallen apart, in my opinion, because if he is correct, these numbers should be about the same. If it's just about social class reproduction, then when somebody attains, um, you know, experiences social mobility, experiences educational mobility, that income mobility should um, match it. 
and it doesn't. So something else is going on. Okay, so what is going on here is the um, what is the basis of um, of uh, what explains the persistence of racial inequality? It starts with housing discrimination. Okay, um, there's a couple of things I want you to do here. So just as a little preview, I'm going to post this um, first this video clip from Race, the Power of an Illusion that goes through a little bit of the history of redlining in the United States. Okay, um, so uh, redlining is the denial of housing loans based on the racial composition of a neighborhood. I'm going to want you also for your in-class activity to go to two maps. One is the redlining maps uh, that gives you like, you know, the history of like what neighborhoods were considered, um, you know, favorable and desirable and ones least desirable to, um, to underwrite loans that the federal government, you know, practiced. And also the racial dot map. And I want you to look at the um, correspondence between those two. Okay, so anyway, so that's that. That's that. You might want to um, this um, this video is in the um, on housing discrimination is on the portal. You may want to pause this recording and go to the portal and open up this um, clip from "Race: The Power of an Illusion." Okay, and so I'll be back in a bit. Okay, I'm back in a bit. So racial discrimination and, uh, or housing discrimination and racial discrimination still takes place, okay? The um, Department of Housing and Urban Development does audits in which they send out people looking to rent houses, buy houses, um, get loans, and things like that. And everything is the same except for race, okay? Race is the only difference here, okay? Um, they looked at um, 28 metropolitan areas um, with their last study in 2012 um, compared to whites. And in the um, rental market, um, blacks were told about 11.4% fewer units and shown 4.2% fewer units than whites. Um, Hispanics are told about 12.5% fewer units and shown 7.5% fewer units than white. And Asians are told about 9.8% fewer units and shown 6.6% fewer units than whites. In the um, home buying market, Blacks are told about 17% fewer homes and shown 17.7% fewer units than whites. And Asians are told about 15.5% fewer homes and shown 18.8% fewer homes than whites. Okay, so these um, this is still happening. Um, you may want to look this up. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but there's this. Um, it even happens over the phone. Um, you know, something called linguistic profiling. Um, if you want more on this, uh, look up a guy named John Baugh, B-A-U-G-H. He's from Stanford University, and he had the experience of having um, a difficult um, time finding a place to live in this area. So he called up um, different uh, places um, using different voices. African-American vernacular English, um, standard or white English, and Chicano English. And uh, he um, found some differences. So you might want to look that up. So, okay. So this is important because this explains the persistence of racial segregation. It starts in with housing discrimination. Once you have that, once you have um, them... Uh, uh, people living in different neighborhoods, particularly whites and African-Americans, everything else follows in terms of um, the quality of the schools, the quality of the, um, of the neighborhood, how clean the neighborhood is, the criminal justice system, um, things like this. All these things start, um, you know, start 
you know, has this ripple effect that starts with housing discrimination. This is what's argued in, uh, you know, um, Douglas Massey and Nancy Denton wrote a book called American Apartheid, and that's what they argue. Okay, that this is um, that housing discrimination is the basis of institutional racism, which I'll get to in a bit. Okay, so um, let's see. Let's go through also some um, some um, types of racism and some theories about um, racism. Okay, so um, types of racism. There's uh, racism. Uh, here's a definition. Uh, the perception and treatment of a racial or ethnic group or member of uh, that group as intellectually, socially, and culturally inferior to one's own group. Okay. So that's a definition of racism. Okay. There are different types of racism to talk about here. Um, lots of different types. I'm just going to focus on a few uh, different ones here. There's old fashioned or traditional racism. This is the overt and obvious racism. Specifically the belief that racial minorities are, um, should live separately from whites because they are considered inferior. Okay. And this particularly pertains uh, traditionally in the United States to African Americans. Okay. Um, that is your, that's your Ku Klux Klan. And that's your, um, you know, um, you know, Nazi party people and, you know, things, people like that. Okay. They, uh, that's the obvious and overt racism, but there's also aversive racism. It's subtle. It's not overt. It's not obvious, but it's still racism. It is like, it's the kind of occurrences in everyday life where you just say like, oh, wait, wait, wait a second. Was that racist? Okay. Um, my favorite example is when, uh, when a white person sees a black person coming down the street and they cross the street. Okay. That's my, that is, um, sometimes that's not so subtle, but it's, um, uh, the white person could say, I was crossing that street anyway, you know, things like that. But yet all these white people crossing the street all the time, that kind of pattern, something's going on. Okay. Let's say fair racism. Um, is um, maintaining the status quo of racial groups and blaming minorities for their own lower socioeconomic status. So these are people who don't want any kind of change in the racial order. They just want to say, keep things as they are. And they make the claims that if racial groups have, um, you know, lower socioeconomic status, well, that's their fault, okay? And they should pull themselves up by their bootstraps, that kind of thing. Um, ignoring the, uh, the social structure and the racist social structure we have, okay? Colorblind racism, this is quite common. It's ignoring legitimate racial, ethnic, and cultural differences between groups, thus denying the reality of such differences, okay? I have a few things to say about colorblind racism because a lot of white people are saying like, hey, we should live in a colorblind society, okay? None of us are colorblind, okay? Um, Nobody is colorblind. Race is one of the first things we notice about somebody. Um, and so we're not colorblind. Okay. And um, so if you ignore race, you ignore racism. Okay. Colorblind racism allows racism to occur without there being a paper trail. Um, for example, um, you know, if we don't document, um, if we don't document, um, you know, different racial groups within an institution, we don't know if racial discrimination is happening. For example, in, in colleges, we know that there is an achievement gap. We know that, um, whites and Asians get higher grades and are more likely to pass a class than African Americans and Latinos. We know this, okay? We would not know it if we took a colorblind approach. We would not know it if we didn't gather the data, okay? The demographic data that would allow us to analyze, um, you know, success rates as we call them, okay? There are many reasons for this and I'll get to that when I get to education, okay? Um, 
Institutional racism is the most insidious. That's racism ingrained in our, ingrained in our social institutions. So racism becomes part of the ordinary practices of everyday life. So when we talked about the criminal justice system and the new Jim Crow and police targeting of African-American communities, that is institutional racism. We will read about and think about like the, um, you know, differential um, achievements of, um, you know, uh, the achievement gap in educational settings. That's institutional racism, things like that. It will happen for quite some time, but it's first of all, it's about a result, not intent. OK, and I just listened to this on NPR yesterday. And a lot of white people think of racism as what's in the heart, the, the intent of the acts. OK, institutional racism can occur without there being a racist. So you can have racism as Ed, Eduardo Benia Silva um, says in his book, you can have racism without racists. OK, so because it is part of the organization of society and it will occur for some time yet to come. If everybody stopped being prejudiced and everybody stopped discriminating, there will still be institutional racism for some time because it will take a while to reorganize society in an equitable way. OK, so um, there's that. Internalized racism is when racial minorities believe the dominant culture's ideas about their own race. Okay, racial minorities are not um, immune from the messages of the dominant culture. Okay, so the um, uh, there's also internalized sexism and internalized homophobia when an oppressed group has internalized the beliefs of the dominant cultures about their own uh, group then that um, is institutional racism or internalized racism okay uh, some examples of this would be uh, the like um, you know the the push for lighter skin um, like the, the bleaching creams and things like that okay and how um, approximating white ideals or more like Western features are more valued, um, you know, that kind of thing. Or also um, among Asian groups, um, there's the uh, eyelid surgery, for example, among some people who like have eyelid surgery in order to approximate more um, uh, Western features. Those would be examples of internalized racism. OK, so but remember, that comes from the dominant culture. OK. Um, first. So those are types of racism, and I want to get to some theories of prejudice and racism here. Um, one is scapegoat theory, okay? Um, this is a psychological theory. It's based on a psychological theory uh, that frustration is often followed by aggression. In the U.S., many white peoples are frustrated in their desire to achieve economic success. Um, rather than looking at the causes of inequality in the U.S., they will often blame minority groups such as immigrants coming from south of the border or affirmative action programs, etc. This is documented in um, Arlie Hochschild's book, Stranger in Their Own Land. She doesn't talk about scapegoat theory um, explicitly, but she does talk about how uh, a group of whites in Louisiana have basically told them a story, themselves a story that says that it's a fair system and they're waiting in line for their turn, and yet they um, believe that other people are cu are cutting in front of them who are racial minorities, and that the government is helping them do that. OK, so that's a, that's and so they end up scapegoating. OK, rather than looking about how um, the economic system itself is um, is stacked against them. OK, um, so white frustration over lack of economic success leads them to blame minorities. That's scapegoat theory. The authoritarian personality comes from the Frankfurt School of Sociology. And these were people who were looking at Nazi Germany and wondered, you know, how that happened. 
Okay. Um, the authoritarian personality says that individuals are more likely to be prejudiced if they first rigidly categorize people, um, are inclined to submit to authority, uh, conformity to social norms in a very strict way, I should say, are intolerant of ambiguity. So the idea of someone being biracial or multiracial just does not make sense and um, are inclined towards superstition, okay? All of this leads to a greater likelihood of stereotyping, placing people in oversimplified categories. Next is assimilation theory. This is a functionalist theory, okay? And this argues that in order for uh, racial groups to be, um, for society to be harmonious, racial minorities should assimilate into the dominant culture. OK, this is the idea of the U.S. as a melting pot where we all come in and blend in. This um, this includes adopting the language of the dominant culture, having the same mannerisms, celebrating the same holidays, basically giving up one's culture and assimilating. OK, the problem is we lose stuff. OK, we lose um, culture here. OK, and really. Um, so this a lot of this stuff with the melting pot applied to European ethnic groups uh, of the 1800s that came to work in industry, such as um, the Irish, the Italians, the Polish. OK, so uh, where um, um, black people could not melt into the pot, according to Eduardo Benia Silva. OK, they could be used as you know, fuel to heat the pot, but they could not blend into the pot, okay? Because, um, you know, really, uh, because of like the meetings we have around race, um, really it makes it imp almost impossible for anyone to, uh, you know, non-white people to assimilate because of, you know, because again, race is opposed upon them, okay? My uh, second favorite theory is uh, contact theory, okay? Uh, this is a sim symbolic interactionist theory that interaction between whites and minorities will lead to less prejudice on both parties' part if, first of all, the interaction is among those of equal status, the interaction is sustained, and social norms favoring equality are present. So this is... Um, so, yeah, if you have people who are just like just not familiar and filled with stereotypes, you put them into you mix them up, put them into contact with one another and they all these stereotypes start falling away. So this is why diversity, one, one of the many reasons why diversity is important. One of the re many reasons why, like, you know, we need diverse institutions is to get people from different backgrounds interacting at an equal status, you know, day to day. And the, you know, and so those social norms and, and so, you know, prejudice and um, is reduced. There's this also applies to sexuality. Um, I had a former student who did some research on um his name is uh, Todd Reiser Oatman. He did some research at um, UC Davis and tested contact theory around sexuality and found that people with more, um, you know, contact with gay people or straight people who had more contact with gay t people were less homophobic. OK, so it's uh, um, so that works for sexuality as well. OK, um, intersectionality. I'm going to, uh, this will be in your um, TED Talk, okay? Intersectionality looks at the effects of racism, classism, and sexism, and all these other, um, you know, and other kinds of, like, inequalities in society. But race, class, and gender is what sociologists pay really close attention to because this is, um, you know, these are, um, structural variables. Okay, this is um, race, class, and gender are three, um, you know, very important ways in which society is structured. Okay, so, um, so um, another thing to talk about is white privilege. Okay, uh, Peggy McIntosh, um, you know, wrote 
an introspective piece about white privilege, and she came up with a lot of things, okay? And they're on here, and you can, um, I'm not going to read them all to you, but you can pause and read these if you want. You know, pause and read these if you want. And there's another slide here. I've never asked to speak for all people in my racial group. I can remain oblivious of the language and customs of persons of color who constitute the world's majority without feeling in my culture any penalty for such oblivion. There is also one I don't have it on here. I guess it's he left it off about um, bandages in quote flesh color that approximates white skin. Okay. Um, their white privilege is basically the uh, the stuff that white people get that's unearned because of race. Okay, there's a couple of things about this um, that I've experienced. I want to tell you about. Uh, one is that um, white it's white privilege to talk about white privilege. Um, the um, generally in a classroom when I talk about white privilege, I am not um, people like want to see. They want to know if it's going to be on the test, really. They don't question me, okay? When racial minorities I know who teach about white privilege, oftentimes their white students resist because they are then, like, thought of, well, you know, you're, you're just angry or something like that. It's also um, male privilege to teach about male privilege because when I talk about feminism, for example, um, my male students just want to know if it's going to be on the test, okay? But when my um, colleagues, uh, my women colleagues, um, uh, they get resistance from their uh, male students sometimes when they talk about feminism, okay? Because it's, uh, um, you know, and they're just stereotyped as just angry. So um, also, white privilege is something that's um, externally imposed, um, you can't make the cop pull you over, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. You can't like a white person can't do that. So the best thing to do is to work for justice. Okay. So anyway, that's probably my yeah lecture on race. So there's a couple things, um, other things that in the module that I want you to take a close look at and, um, okay, great. Have a great day.